Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, Elisha, my husband, is dead. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bond men. And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Amen. I uh, I want to preach to you tonight, the Lord to help me, stand by us. I want to preach on when you reach the end of your rope. When you reach the end of your rope. I uh, I actually had forgot about, I went to this text uh, sometime today here at the office when I was here and, and uh, got in here and flipped over to the text and, and remembered just a couple, oh, not even a couple, but a month or so ago down at the Zor Holiness Church on a Friday night, Brother Frankie Dunn, young preacher boy from Brother Rusty Johnson's church, preached out of this text, and he preached on God's stimulus package. Amen. We've been hearing a lot of things about stimulus pack, you know, to, and he preached that day so, that night so great on God's stimulus package. But I want to preach from it on when you reach the end of your rope. James Dobson on one of his programs tells a true story of a little toddler named Frankie. He was a handful to say the least, and one day he pulled a chair over to the front window of his house and carefully placed it inside the drapes. He was standing there staring out at the world when his mother came looking for him. She spied his little white legs protruding beneath the drapes and quietly slipped in behind him to see what he was doing. She got there just to hear him say to himself in very somber terms, I've got to get out of here. Amen. Well, you ever feel like that? You ever feel like you're just trapped and you got to get out? You ever feel like you're at the end of your rope? You ever, you ever feel like you've reached that point? I have. Amen. I'm 43 years. There's been a few times in my Christian life, in my marriage life, and, and my being a father and being, you know, taking care of the bills. There's been times I felt like I reached the end of the road. What do you do when you're facing problems with your children that you cannot solve? Huh? What do you do when you, your marriage is on the rocks and crashing waves of hopelessness are unrelenting? What do you do? What do you do when there are problems at work and it seems that there's no way out? What do you do when you have too much month left at the end of your money? You got that, didn't you? What to do when you have a, a, have followed a loved one's body to the graveyard and you cannot escape the loneliness the grief, and the pain. What do you do when your heart is broken, your dreams are shattered, and your hopes have been dashed to bits on the cruel rocks of reality? What do you do? What do you do when you're walking through a spiritual wasteland and there seems to be no way out? I'll tell you something. I don't think anyone but the Lord has the answers to all of those questions. You ever been, you ever been asked the question that you really didn't know the answer and really that way you wasn't embarrassed to say the answer that you didn't know, but you just knew that that's not the answer that that person wanted to, 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 for you to answer. What do I do, preacher? Of course, I get that sometimes, not a lot, but as a preacher and a pastor, some folks do say, what do I do? Amen. With this situation. Amen. Well, I, there's times I'll be honest. I really don't know. Amen. I'm just honest. I wish I could tell you that I had all the answers, but I don't in myself. Amen. But we see in our text a woman that is at the end of her road. 
Now, I'm going to try to paint a little scripture picture here if the Lord would help me. Amen. Matter of fact, there is a, a very few characters in this story. You only have a widow woman. Amen. And you'd be surprised of how many times in the Bible that the Bible talks about widow women. Amen. Matter of fact, I preached the message one time and thought about it a week or two ago. I looked at some of my notes and glancing through there, and I remember preaching a sermon one time on the unknown widow. Amen. Matter of fact, through the Bible, there's several times that the Bible talks about widow women. Amen. Being there, and in, but in times of perplexity, in times just like this woman, unknown, unnamed. Amen. Widow woman. She, her husband has passed away. Amen. She has two sons. She's broke. I mean, you're talking about somebody at the end of the rope. This woman is. She did not know what to do. She did not know where to turn. And her pain and her poverty, she did the only thing that she knew she could do is she turned, <coughs> excuse me, to the Lord. When she did that, God came through for her in a very big way. Amen. I like this. I got this highlighted so I wouldn't forget to read it. It said, this passage teaches us that the glorious truth that God has a plan for our every problem. These verses show us that just as God took care of this widow woman, He will take care of you and I. This passage lets us know that when we reach the end of our rope, there is hell and there is hope. I want to preach to you tonight on what to do, amen, when you're at the end of your rope, when you reach the end of your rope, when you feel like you can just pull your hair out. You ever been there? You feel like your nerves are just trembling and you can't sleep at night. I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. I've been there where your whole body is shaking in bed and your wife says, why are you shaking? I said, I can't stop. I can't stop. I feel like I'm, I don't feel like I'm shaking outside. I feel like I'm shaking inside. And uh, I, I, I wish I could tell you that I've never had that, but I, I, I've had that, Brother Daniel. I've had that pressure, amen, financially and just different areas. I've had that pressure pastoring, amen. I'm in pastoring the church in Hazard, and, man, I was under so much pressure, and Bev was sick, and, and just struggling along, and I remember I was so much pressure, Brother Brad, that my whole body broke out in sores. I never had that to happen before or since. I was such under stress and pressure and nerves. This woman was like that. Amen. What do you do? I mean, it sounds like she has just recently lost her husband. Matter of fact, you can see, amen, that God knows her problems. She's, she's, she was in despair. Notice the word, the word cried, amen, the third word. Now there cried a certain woman, amen. I mean, that word cried in the Hebrew means to, 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 to moan, to weep uncontrollably, to, to speak out of grief. Amen, it's a word that identifies the sound of a broken heart. Don't read this text casually without seeing this woman's broken heart. Amen. She has, she's at the end of her road. I mean, she doesn't have anyone. Amen. Or anything. She is at the bottom. She's at the end. Amen. Amen. This woman comes to the man of God at the lowest moment of her life. She is in desperate straits. Have you ever been there? Amen. The second thing I want you to notice, not just despair, but there was death in this family. The Bible said, notice in my text, the Bible said she was married to one of Elijah's, amen, servants. And her husband now is dead. He was one of the sons of the prophets. These were the men who were in the training under Elisha in the Old Testament to be prophets and preachers in Israel. Amen. And she's saying, he was my husband. He was my friend. He was my provider. He was my protector. He had been, now he's taken away from her in death and she's broken because a loved one has been taken away. 
Amen. No longer does she have that, amen, strong identity in her home to lean on. No longer does she have that one, that provider. The provider would know what to do. He'd go out and get a job. He'd work and, amen, pay the debt. She's in debt. Amen. I mean, she's in debt. She has no money. She has no income. She thinks she has no sources. Amen. But here, since her husband is dead and she cannot pay the bills. Amen. As a result, her creditors are coming to take her sons away as slaves so they can work off the debt. Now, that's legally, by the law, that was all right. Leviticus 25 and 39 gives you that, hurt them that reason. So they, that ability to do that. But she's been deprived of her husband. Now she's about to lose her sons as well. She's over her head in debt. And she doesn't see how she can make it. You just thought you was in trouble. <laughs> I mean, when you think of this lady. You ever, you ever, you ever, you ever watch? I mean, the Bible, you talking about widows and you want to get real technical. You go over the New Testament. I mean, it, it's pretty strong about what you think and do and support widows and widows indeed, the Bible says. Amen. So this woman was a widow. Amen. She was in debt. She had suffered death. Amen. But there was one other thing. She was a woman of devotion. Amen. In spite of all her problems, she still held firm in the grip of faith. Amen. Help me, Holy Ghost. She needs help, but she, I want you to notice this. She does not turn to her family or her friends. She does not try to find someone to loan her the money. In her desperation, she turns to the man of God for help. Elijah was God's representative on earth, and he was her best hope. She reminds Elijah that her husband, he did fear the Lord. Remember Elijah? He did fear the Lord. Her life has been a life of devotion to the Lord and her trouble. And she still trusts in Him and turns to Him for the things she needs. And in spite of her pain, listen to me, in spite of her problems, in spite of her lack of possibilities, she still looked up to God for the help she needed. I'll tell you something about a praying person. A praying person will pray. A praying, matter of fact, I don't have this in my notes, but it says over in the book of Job, I don't have the particular chapter right off, forgive me for that, I didn't plan on mentioning this, amen, but over in Job, and it talks about the hypocrite, there's one thing about a hypocrite, it says, and it says this, will a hypocrite always pray? Amen, one sure sign of a hypocrite is a person that don't pray always. Amen, what the scripture there is saying in Job, he's saying the only time a hypocrite will pray is when they're in trouble. Come on here now, you've seen them. I said the only time they run to God is when they get in a pickle, when they get in a fix, then they want to get real spiritual, but let the problem sort of ease off and work off. And guess what? They're back out the door and they don't have, you know, with a hypocrite. All oh, but this woman wasn't a hypocrite. She was a praying woman. She was a woman of devotion. Amen. Matter of fact, just the fact that she not, didn't go to her family, she didn't go to her friends in this town. But she turned to the man of God, which in Old Testament times, he was God's representative on earth. And she turned to him. Even though she couldn't see a way out, she knew that she couldn't see everything. Even though she didn't understand everything she was facing, she still believed that God cared and that he could do something about her situation. So she cried out to him in faith. I want to tell you something, at some time, at some point, every person in this room, every person in this sanctuary tonight is going to arrive at this point in your life. 
Some of you might be there right now, but there'll come a day, amen, just like this when everything goes wrong. I mean, everybody you've leaned on has let you down. Amen. They're not there when the money's run out and there's no money in the checking account and friends have turned into foes. You ever been there? Amen. If you've not been, stay tuned. Life will soon meet you on the road and you'll find your place just like this woman. When you reach that point, the world The flesh and the devil are all going to tell you that God doesn't see and that God doesn't care. I never will forget probably one of the most lowest times of my life. Amen. Is when my wife had that seizure, the second seizure, their second seizure, her first one. Amen. She'd had like four years before. Then the second was was on January the first. Amen. I never will forget. Amen. As that she had that seizure and and hadn't had one in four years. I mean, my world. I was evangelizing. Amen. Praying and seeking God, but brother David, my world come to a crash and stop right there that night. I remember mom was there and we were home because it was winter time. And I never will forget. Get though, amen. You might have. I think I've told this once since I've been here, so you bear with me. But I never forget. I walking through the kitchen and the dining room, and Mom was in there with Bev, and I was just praying. And I remember I was literally pacing, Brother Russell, back and forth, amen. And I was I was confused. I'd called Brother Gabbard. I'd called nine one one, and they were on their way, and and I didn't know exactly if it was a seizure at that time, but that's what it ended up being. I didn't know, but my life, I. But I never forget in my mind. I don't know how it happened. I cannot say and I'm not charismatic. I'm not into dreams and visions, but I do believe in them. I do believe God gives dreams and visions, but I don't have them every night and every week and every month. Amen. But somehow in my mind, the devil, I said the devil took my mind. Amen. And he took me back to when I was just a little toddler, maybe six months old. And somehow I was standing or, amen, in the air or something. I don't know what you want to call it. Maybe in a trance. I do not know. But I knew I looked over in a crib and I saw a little boy and I knew that that boy was me. And the devil said, see, your mama, she didn't want you. God don't love you. God don't care. you, and he went through that and he started there. I've never had that experience before or since, but it was just as real as I'm looking at you right now. I remember, I remember in that whatever it was, I, amen, I, I just, my, I just felt my faith drain out of me. I felt everything get weak. I felt, amen, the devil just clamping that vice on my mind a little bit tighter. Amen, I was sort of, you know, uh, just, questioning God about my wife and I wasn't just upset I wasn't in a bad spirit nothing like that but I was just saying God I don't understand Lord I've preached we've preached across this country but I've seen that even I've seen through my childhood different things and probably what was only a couple of minutes seemed like for eternity but I remember different things and all through that amen the devil was saying amen he doesn't care God doesn't care God doesn't love you I want to tell you when you get to the end end of your row. you talking about mind battles. I'm not talking about having a flat tire on a rainy day. I'm talking about, amen, when you feel like your nerves, amen, that you can't handle no more. You feel like you're just about to explode. You don't know what to do. You don't know what. You don't even want the sun to come up in the morning because you don't want to face another day. Amen. I'm telling you, this woman was at it. Don't read these, amen, five or six verses. This woman was a widow. She had two sons and they were fixing to take her two sons away amen to be slaves to pay for the debt she couldn't pay amen it don't get no worse than that when you've lost your husband and now you're fixing to lose your two children to be slaves but this woman was a woman of devotion and she prayed amen That's exactly, and I remember, amen, after about two minutes of that, I remember the Holy Ghost coming on me. I said, the Holy Ghost coming on me. 
I remember the Holy Ghost. I remember standing in the, I mean, the, the kitchen part where the table was at at mom's house. Sister Karen, the Holy Ghost coming on me. Amen. All of a sudden I began to see different things. I seen an altar with black and red carpet at Stenic Gap Church of God. And I seen a 17 year old boy kneeling down right on this side of the altar. Amen. And I prayed through to old time salvation. And the Holy Ghost said, remember that? Remember, am I talking to anybody? And I remember the Holy Ghost showing me, amen, six months later while I was up under a pew and speaking in other tongues. And God baptized me in the Holy Ghost. And God said, remember that? You see, the devils knew I was down. The devils seen I was at the end of my road. But thank God to the Holy Ghost that He'll come to you right when you're down to nothing. Right when you feel like you ain't got a hope. Feel like you ain't got a prayer. Feel like you can't do another mile. Thank God to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost can come upon you just like that. Woo! And the Holy Ghost, amen, pointed that out. And he pointed out when I got called to preach. Amen. He said, you remember that? I said, yes, Lord. Amen. And he showed me my beautiful wife. And he said, remember that when you got married? Amen. And I said, yes, Lord. And he showed me Sabrina when she was born. And all of a sudden, faith felt like, amen, I could charge hell with a water pistol, like Joey Hyatt used to say. Amen. I'll tell you something. If you ain't, you might, you might, I feel like there, could you be here tonight? Maybe be a visitor. Maybe somebody just struggled along in here. You say, well, nobody knew what I'm going through, preacher. Amen. Yeah, you probably made me right. Amen. But there's a God that knows what you're going through. There's a God that knows what I'm going through. And you know what? He knows the low limit you can take. Amen. He knows the low limit you can take. Amen. I remember a little cartoon I seen. I, I never forget. Amen. And it was talking about our trials as a Christian. It was talking about our, our trials and the fire trials, you know. Amen. And it showed a little thermostat over here on the wall. And it showed a hand. You could tell it was God's hand. And, and, and the little caption said, Amen, about our trials. Don't, don't worry. In other words, God's hand is on the thermostat. He can turn it upward. It's, it, he's in control, brother John. And, amen. And I, I, the little cartoon, I, I remember seeing it. And that's what God was showing me. I'm in control. Amen. I know the devil tried to show you everything bad that's happened. But amen. But God showed me some good things. I'm not here to tell you the bad things. I'm telling you, God is good. This woman right here knew something about God. I'm not trying to add to it. Amen. But she knew that there was a prayer answering God. Oh, yes. These verses are designed to teach us. Amen. That our problems, while they may appear to be insurmountable in our eyes, are, are really just God's opportunities in disguise. Therefore, no matter what you are called on to face in this life, learn to turn to the Lord first for the help you need. He cares. He's able. Can I hear an amen? And He'll work in your need. Now, I want you to notice this. You know, sometimes, this helped me today when I read this and got to study this little scripture. Amen. It would have been easy for Elijah here to say, Okay, sister, you've suffered enough. And the Lord is going to meet your need. Just go home and wait for him to work. But it didn't work out that way. Instead of taking that course, the Lord chose to involve this widow in her own miracle. Stay, 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 stay with me. First, God had to do some things. He first had to erase her faith by forcing her to admit what she didn't have. Then, stay with me, you'll understand what I mean. God expanded her faith by teaching her to trust, humility, and obedience. God first erased her faith. Now, what do you mean? The Lord erased the widow's faith through two questions asked by Elijah. What do you need and what do you have? Let me ask you those two questions. Put yourself and... What do you need tonight? Well, preacher, I need a miracle financially. Preacher, I need a, I need a miracle in this situation. I need a miracle here. 
I need a miracle in my body. I need a miracle that nobody knows about except me and my spouse. I need a miracle in this. Well, what do you have? By these two questions, this woman, and I like this, was made to see the size of her need and the smallness of her own resources. Did you get that? God made her to see through these questions the size of her need, but He also let her see the smallness of her own resources. She needed everything and she had very little. She needed much, but she could not possibly meet her own needs. God often uses trials, heartaches, and burdens of life to bring us to the place where we can honestly see our need and our own inability to meet it. I'll tell you something, though, but when God stops, but when we stop, rather, and honestly answer those two questions, we realize that we need more than we will ever be able to supply by ourselves. Sometimes God's got to take it out of our hands because we're human. We'll try to fix it. Won't we do it? God did this to erase her f- her faith. He isn't trying to erase our faith in, amen, Him. He's trying to erase our faith and her faith in herself. As long as we think we can, He won't. Amen. But it's at that time that you finally say, you throw up your hand. I don't know what to do. And God might say, that's what I've been wanting you to say all along. Because you've been trying to figure it out. We do, don't we? I do. Try to figure it out. You get in a situation, man, you get that brain of work. It's like a computer. You'll try to figure this out and this, this out and this out and this out. But I'll tell you what. Even when you go to God and say, God, it's your battle. I'm your child. I'm leaning on you. I'm coming to you. You know, that's what happened there in Joshua chapter 7 when the children of Israel went to the city of Ahi. Remember that text? They'd just come through a great battle of Jericho. Amen. And now they're facing this city of Ahi. Amen. It's only a small city. So they, they sort of pride themselves in their ability, their own ability. They forgot that it was God that helped them at Jericho. They forgot that it was God that brought the walls down. They forgot that it was God with them. Amen. So here they are facing this city. Amen. They don't pray about it. They just sent up a few, amen, men there, three thousand men it's going to be a piece of cake amen but what happens is they get up there amen and they get whipped 36 men lose their lives because they got confident in them own selves they got lifted up in pride you can't do it i can't do it there are some things that you can't figure out Some things you can't explain. Huh? That's right. So this woman here, she is told by the man of God, amen, that she has. Listen to what he says. Elijah said to her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me what hast thou in the house? And she said, thy handmaid had not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Amen. Amen. This question, what hast thou in the house, was designed to teach this widow woman that it may not have looked like she had much, but in reality she had already had everything she needed to obtain what she wanted. She couldn't see it, but God had already given her the very thing he would use to meet her need. Now, I didn't know this till today as I was reading this, but this pot of oil refers to a Word called a flask, F-L-A-S-K. This oil here, one writer said, was probably a, amen, the small amount of anointing oil used by the prophets to anoint the men of God. And this little flask of oil has sat in the house, though, unused since her husband died. But this little insignificant flask of oil 
would be the answer to her prayers. I'll tell you something. Think about it. If you're saved tonight, you're a child of God. How many child of, any man a child of God here tonight? Raise your hand. You're a child of God. You are a child of God. I'll tell you something. He's promised to hear your prayers. Has he? Okay, about seven of us. He has promised in his word to hear our prayers. And i got to hurry. He's promised to answer our prayers. He's promised to meet every need we have. My God shall supply all your need according. That's it. God gives this woman provision. The woman, amen, after she tells her son and she obeys what the man of God has said, goes and borrows vessels, amen, and, and, and brings them back and she begins to pour in and God works miracle after miracle after miracle. Have you ever paid a bill that you thought you weren't going to be able to? You ever made a way where it didn't seem like there was one? You ever seen God work when you thought there was no way possible it was ever going to happen? Oh, yes. Amen. I don't tell you, I've seen God move. Amen. Like that. Amen. Just give me an example. When we was looking at this little place at Marbury and, and I went to the banker there and and uh, she told me I was pre-approved for a certain amount. And then we searched and we found and we looked and we decided on a certain place. And then we went back and we paid for the uh, appraisal and the survey or whatever and the different things there it takes. Amen. Then she come back. She said, uh, we're sorry, but uh, uh, they disapproved you. They didn't approve you. I said, wait a second, you just approved me four weeks ago. Amen, you approved me. Of course, that was right when all this uh, Fannie Mae and all that hit the news, you know. And and uh, then they come back, and I talked to her a little bit more, and a week later, she did what? She approved it. What looked impossible. Amen, the lady, the banker said, I've never, I've never, with the credit score, everything, I've never seen them deny nothing like this. And she said, it has to be what's in the news and everything going on. Amen, but I'll tell you something, God moved. Aren't you glad of that? Amen, aren't you glad that God has moved? Amen, come to the piano, hope. Where to do when you're at the end of the rope? Well, I just got done writing a little song. Are your problems overwhelming you? Crushed by hopelessness. The journey through your valley seems meaningless. 